display their power and say, hey, check me out. No. Rather, these miracles are attached to some word revelation. In this case, Jesus states unequivocally that he is the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never ever thirst. The miracle along with the word revelation, they go together. And you can do this in every single miracle in the Bible, that the miracle is demonstrated and the word revelation comes thereafter. The same thing with the man, the paralytic at the pool of Siloam. Once again, Jesus is making the argument, uh, this particularly happens on the Sabbath, that he is the God of life. And because this happened on the Sabbath, Jesus is claiming that he has authority over the Sabbath, and it begs the question, who has authority over a day that God established by his activity? Who has authority over a day that God has put in the Ten Commandments? Well, God himself. The answer is quite obvious, particularly when he is saying that he is equal to the Father. The miracle, the word revelation. Additionally, we have the raising of Lazarus. I skipped uh, Pastor's example here in John 2. I would like to use my own example here with the raising of Lazarus. And thereafter, he states that he is the resurrection and the life. The miracle and then the word revelation. Continuing in our recap, what we warned against and Pastor warns against is a broad sweep of typological interpretation where we just see something and we, we want to broad brush it saying that it's a type of Christ. And I use the example that Pastor always uses and he wanted me to teach this. So here's Joseph. I grabbed this graphic off the internet. You know, and you see all these similarities there in the center column. Uh, and some of them are a bit of a stretch. We can also do this with Isaac. And what I taught last class is that Isaac Joseph, they are not a per se types of Christ. Rather, we can see that this incident is a type of Christ. We can apply this incident, the uh, attempted sacrifice of Isaac has what is called typological themes to it and aspects and facets to it. That this is some kind of prefigurement, a foreshadowing that's going to culminate in Christ. This, indeed, is a type, and we also covered an interpretive principle that not all types have to be types in every single aspect. Uh, that is to say that Isaac here doesn't necessarily need to be 33 years old to match that Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross at 33. No, it doesn't necessarily need to be a type in every single aspect. Uh, we also went over the fact that all types are symbols, but not all symbols our types. We then led on a study in Elijah where he in Malachi we read that he will turn the fathers, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the ch hearts of the children to the fathers. And I as an ex-Mormon used to believe this had to do something with baptism for the dead um, and that Joseph Smith was this sort of um, Elijah forerunner character. The only problem is it doesn't jive well with the scriptures as I mentioned in the last class. Elijah, Christ says in Matthew 17, Elijah has already come. And then his disciples understood that he was speaking of the, to them of John the Baptist. And we read in Luke chapter 1 that indeed Luke applies the scripture in Malachi uh, of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. and its culmination found in the New Testament. We continue on, and I led an extended study into, we spoke about 15 minutes on just on Melchizedek, that there are, I only covered the Old Testament here, and that was intentional. There are only two passages in the entire Old Testament referencing Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is found in Genesis chapter 14, He's a king, and Abraham, Abram, excuse me, Abram offers, gives him a tenth of the spoils of war to him. 
We read then a, a messianic prophecy found in Psalm 110, uh, where uh, David writes that the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The most quoted verse from the Old Testament in the New. And as you see at the bottom there, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. From there, let me get my bearings here, or re rearrange some slides. From there, I was saying that this messianic prophecy hangs there for a thousand years. Simply hangs there. And we read about this Aaronic priesthood. And we hear and we see the aspect that in Numbers chapter 3 that it has to only go through the Levites. And I as a Mormon thought I held the Aaronic priesthood even though I was deemed from a descendant from the tribe of Manasseh. That's what they told me anyway as a Mormon. So I was actually blaspheming God in holding something I never really had any right to hold. For if you were to transport me back into ancient Israel, I would be stoned to death for such a violation. And that's what I tell elders every single time I see them and missionaries. Uh, you are holding something that if your tribe, what they deem, they told you what your tribe descendancy is from, you should be stoned to death as according to the scripture. Um, so that's very important. I want you to keep that in mind as I continue on in this class, that it has to tie with descendancy. You have to be a Levite. And we see a violation of kings. Kings cannot be priests and priests cannot be kings simultaneously in the, in the Old Testament. We see King Uzziah, we see King Saul offering sacrifice when he shouldn't be, and that's why he's rejected. Finally, I ended last class in this five-minute recap. It's extended a little longer than I would have liked, but I'll try to keep going. And I finished last class citing the reason why the Aaronic priesthood even arose. And the reason why the Aaronic priesthood even arose, we find that in Exodus chapter 3, where God commissions through the burning bush scene Moses to tell Pharaoh that he's going to let, that he's supposed to let the Israelites free. Um, but in this scene here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, um, you know, let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to our Lord, our God. And Moses says, you know what? I, I don't believe you, God. <laughs> Flat out just says it. I just, just don't believe you. And Moses says he's not eloquent, continues making excuses. I'm slow of speech. So something is broken here. We have Adam. We have Moses. Uh, excuse me. We have Adam. We have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, and in a sense, Joseph, one, 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 one sort of mediator, patriarch, as it were. But then we get to Moses, and because of his unbelief now, and as I, now I remember the words that I wanted to use, at best, at best, this is a condescension by God. In the moderate view, this is a concession by God. And at worst, it's a condemnation by God. That he has to choose a sort of coal helper here. In this case, Aaron. And so his anger, Yahweh's anger is kindled against Moses. And we sort of see the fact that uh, Moses is either incompetent or fully disobedient, that he leaves Aaron, he leaves without, he leaves Egypt, leaves for Egypt without Aaron in Exodus 4, 24 through 27. You see this whole episode of him failing to circumcise his son, and at the end of it, he finally links back up with Aaron. And then at, the, at Exodus you know, 4, 5, and 6, we see this genealogy being laid out. And those are very boring for a lot of people, but this has theological significance. This is trying to demonstrate this bifurcation where we have now two and then this Aaronic priesthood is instituted. And it's all because of the unbelief of Moses. And like I said, it's either going to be a 
condescension, a concession, or a condemnation by Yahweh. You take your view. So, any questions before I continue on the material for this class? I know it was a quick recap of last class. Excellent. So, once again, we're dealing with types. Types are nonverbal prophecies. They are prefigurements, foreshadowing, that lead to a culmination. We continue on with Melchizedek, a very notoriously difficult subject to cover. We continue on with Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. It states, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be a high priest, but it was appointed to him, who said, and here, um, David, David is quoted here in the book of Psalm, Psalms, excuse me, Psalm 2, 7, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, that's Psalm 110, which we read in last class, the Messianic prophecy, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. We move on to the next set of verses. Also, he was a son. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Once again, any and all questions are open if you want to raise your hand and interrupt. Let's go ahead and continue. Where, this is now Hebrews 6.20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now you're saying to yourself, what is this whole language of after the order of Melchizedek, after the order of Melchizedek now found in the New Testament, and applying that to Jesus? We get the culmination of this, and you know how Romans goes well, you know, the whole argument goes from one and culminates in chapter eight. Hebrews is the same way, you know, chapters one through six, and it culminates in the seven and eight, the argument that is being laid before there. Now, before I continue on this, I want, and in the context of Hebrews, it's obviously being written to a Jewish audience, but what it's by, but the reason why it's written is that there are some Jews that are converted to Christians, and they're 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 contemplating, you know, what maybe we should uh, continue this whole sacrifice thing in Mosaic law and uh, circumcision type of thing. So I'm going to say something controversial here <laughs> that I always like to do. You know, don't imitate Jesus. Well, what? Don't imitate Jesus. Well, yeah, um, he was born in a different era of salvation history. He was obviously circumcised. Um, so let's just take a let's just take a newly baptized Christian who's uncircumcised, and he decides to circumcise himself uh, for religious reasons to quote imitate. Christ. He would actually be in violation of the New Testament gospel because he would be going back to something that, yes, we are to imitate Jesus in terms of following the commandments, uh, but in other ways we are not, actually. For if we were to do so, we would be violating uh, something that he's already accomplished, he's, he's already fulfilled. I'm just giving you one example, say circumcision in this case. So, don't take me the wrong way there. And there are other things, you know, obviously Jesus um, was faithful to the Mosaic Law with his temple observance and so on and so forth, but if I were to offer sacrifices upon an altar, I would be blaspheming the sacrifice of Christ. So in this manner, I can't imitate Jesus in that manner and other things I, I should. So, I continue on with Hebrews chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, now what is the question for, now I like to get into questions now that I've reviewed everything, questions for the class. Where is this Old Testament city of Salem? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I was hoping to get a silence on that. <laughs> Very good. Because that, I would have helped out the class by saying, you know, king of Salem, then you would have said Jerusalem. It would have been easy to tie it there. That's key. 
priest of the Most High God, El Elyon in Hebrew, but this is in Greek, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. We already read that in Genesis. That Abraham gives a tenth of the spoils of the war to Melchizedek. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, or Salem. That is, king of peace. Now notice here. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, and he continues forever a priest. That resembling there is very important. Now, I agree with Pastor on this very firmly, that Melchizedek is a real historical figure and not a divine figure. And I repeat that. I agree with Pastor in stating, fully agree with him in stating that Melchizedek is a historical person, not a divine figure. Yes. So you're saying this isn't a Christophany? Because I've heard like That's correct. I am articulating and I agree with Pastor that this is not a Christophany. And I agree with Pastor Lyons on this, and I'm going to prove my case here, here as best I can. Now this phrase has been taken by a very small amount of scholars to mean just that. The majority of scholars take the position that Lyons and I do. Or I, we, I should actually say that we share their position, because <laughs> I'm, I'm nothing special. Uh, so. This language, without father or mother or genealogy, we can contextualize this in a number of ways. In the Greco-Roman context, using this type of language would, can be used of someone that's divinized. But it also could be used, and I'm not trying to, I'm not swearing here up at the pulpit, this is an actual proper use of the term, meaning that he was a bastard, or an illegitimate child, without father or mother, or genealogy. But both those pr present some problems, don't they? <laughs> if we were to take this language literally, uh, those would probably be our two options there, like full literalism. But we are to take this analogically, typologically, and that's the subject we're covering right now in hermeneutics, tip typology, types. Question for the class. Is there another character in the biblical narrative that also is without father and mother or genealogy? What's his name? Adam. Adam. Are you to say Adam is a divine figure? Answer, no, obviously. Or else you would break the creation-creator distinction. So, I argue, and you know, Pastor likes to say, consistency is a tough taskmaster. I like to say, you know, the, the sign of a failed argument is inconsistency. The sign of a failed argument is inconsistency. So if you're going to apply this without father and mother or genealogy being divine to Melchizedek, you're going to have you can't do that. The writer of the Hebrews is arguing typologically here. He also makes the distinction, that's why I have it in red, but resembling, in the Greek, aphoi moi omenos, resembling the Son of God. Melchizedek resembles the Son of God, assimilates the Son of God, not the reverse. Jesus is not assimilating or resembling Melchizedek, rather, Melchizedek resembles Jesus. That language right there, that, that word right there is the clincher for me, that he is speaking typologically, particularly in the Greek, the, the uh, perfect passive participle there. Um, so that's what I would argue. Any questions on that before I continue? Um, the reason it's typological without father or mother or genealogy, that is to say it's being differentiated from the Aaronic priesthood that is contingent upon 
descendancy, tribal affiliation. Let me state that again. He is trying to make the argument, the writer of the Hebrews is saying, that the reason why he's putting this in here is because it's an argument from silence, because in the Old Testament, in Genesis 14, we don't have any genealogy from Melchizedek. He is saying that this priesthood is not contingent on descendancy through the Levi, through Levite, a Levi, or tribal affiliation. And neither beginning, neither beginning of days nor end of life. And that is to say, also I have that tied with he continues a priest forever. In the Old Testament. How was the Aaronic priesthood passed on? Was it, or was it passed on? Yes or no? Yes. And it would conceivably be passed on in perpetuity. Theoretically, right? Let's just say Jesus never came, it'd still be existent today, theoretically, right? It'd just keep going in perpetuity. Passed on and passed on and passed on, another high priest, another high priest, another high priest. But the differentiation between the Aaronic priesthood that's passed on through generation after generation after generation contrasts with this priesthood. After the order of Melchizedek, can this one be passed on? No. no. Why? Because it's one person. Amen. Namely? Christ. Christ. It can't be passed on. He is a priest and continues to be a priest forever. The type in the Old Testament is that Melchizedek never passed it on to anybody else. It's sort of an argument from science. Question. So that would kind of explain why when Jesus said that the temple would get destroyed in 70 AD, it was just destroyed because it wasn't necessary for the sacrifice and the Levites anyways. And the veil is torn too, right. which is also right. a, ty a type type fulfilled, by the way. Yeah, because now there's open access. As Hebrews says, we can now come with boldness and confidence before the throne. And one verse that I always like to share with the Mormons, because I too held supposedly the Melchizedek priesthood as a Mormon. The only problem is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 20, 7, verse 24, excuse me, says, He holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The Greek there, abarabaton, which is to say it cannot be transferred. Because if it was transferred, Christ is not our high priest anymore. It cannot be transferred because he is my high priest and mediates for me before the Father. The argument continues in Hebrews. Great this man to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth, the spoils, and this descend, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brother, though these were uh, uh, also our descendant from Abraham. But this man, this man, who does not have his descent from them, why doesn't he have a descent from them? He came way before Levi even existed. Way before Levi even existed. So his priesthood is not contingent on descendancy. You see the argument that the writer of the Hebrews is making here. We continue on. It is beyond dispute that the inferior blessed the superior. And I had asked the question in the class prior, who is in that scene in Genesis, superior. I am under the authority and the pastor, I am under their authority. I give my tithe to them. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by, whom, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, pays tithes through Abraham, and he, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now this is where I disagree with Pastor, <laughs> I have to admit. You know, Pastor has uh, uh, 
And I, I'm not going to stand up here and disparage him. Uh, I have high respect for him. This is an undergraduate class taught at that level. Uh, so really, I'll be quite frank with you, really haven't heard anything meaningful from Pastor in terms of scientific, science and religion, something substantive. Usually the answers that I hear are typically of fundamentalist Christian in nature. I myself, um, I would consider myself a fundamentalist, but in certain aspects I do have moderate tendencies, and this will be one of them. Um, in this case, and I, I will provide uh, what I would think Pastor Lyons would respond with this, and once again this will be a little controversial. So the way I see this verse, the, way, the section that I have highlighted, Levi being in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him, you have to understand that this is, the Bible is written in a pre-enlightenment, pre-scientific age. And quite frankly, it's not written as a scientific manual that I agree with Pastor on. It's not making any scientific arguments per se. Uh, but um, this would be one point of divergence where I would have with Pastor where he says, you know, when the Bible touches things of science, it's always right. Um, I'm not so sure here. And I'm not, I, I do affirm inerrancy. Uh, because I'm going to show you how I interpret this verse. Because the writer of the Hebrews is making theological messaging, he is not making this as a scientific argument. So if I were to say that this is an argument making scientific points, mm, I'm taking it out of context. What the writer here is saying, theologically speaking, is that Levi, in the loins of Abraham, is subservient to Melchizedek because Levi is a descendant of Abraham and Abraham pays Melchizedek the tithe and that the Aaronic priesthood is subservient to Melchizedek. The Aaronic priesthood is inferior to the superior Melchizedek priesthood. That's a theological messaging. Put period, end of discussion. Uh, but if we were to say that this is science now, this would be incorrect. Because we know 23 chromosomes come from the male and 23 come from the female. But in ancient times, the ancient peoples believed all the way up until the Roman times and thereafter that the entire being, birth, human growing in the mother's womb came exclusively from the male. And they're demonstrating to this. They're demonstrating that sort of thought here, in the when the writer of the Hebrews writes this. So if we were to say that this is science speaking, quite frankly, they got it wrong. But I'm saying to you that this is theological messaging. This is not science. That's not what the purpose of this writing is. Um, so that's the way I would I would question Pastor when he says when it touches science, if he wants to make this thing about science, you have a problem there. But, to be fair now to Pastor, the way I think he would respond to this is he, say, he would say, um, this really doesn't have anything to do with science, it has to do with federal headship. Like Adam is our federal head, so in a sense, Levi here. Yeah. So did you talk to him? No, I haven't, I haven't brought, I've never brought this up to him. That's where I think he would say, this represents federal headship, not science. So, but if we were trying to say that you know, Levi's in the loins of his ancestor, because that's what their, their, their view was back then, that the baby came exclusively from the male. But now we know 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes. Okay, how did they explain the name instead of having Alexander? <laughs> Did that start later? No. No. Like, isn't that No, I... I we can get through that on Harada Tassin, but I'll, I'll come back to that. That's off topic. Um, uh, can you, what does he mean exactly by federal headship? Okay, so like Adam is our federal head. So he, when he sinned, you know, it's sort of we're culpable through original sin. So he's our federal head. But in this case, the way I, I think Pastor would argue is that uh, a Abraham in his loins is a sort of federal headship for Levi because Levi still doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what that that would probably be his answer. Now, 
Let me continue. All I want to say is that, that Levi here is subservient through the loins of Abraham and showing that typologically the Aaronic priesthood is inferior to the Melchizedek priesthood because Levi was in the loins of Abraham when he gave that tithe. I'm saying strictly here that this is theological. It has nothing to do with science here. That's how I continue with affirming inerrancy because that's not what the writer of the Hebrews here is angling for. Not science, no. Theological. Now, if the perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, notice this, for under it the people received the law, what further need would we have been for another priest to arise after the order of Kizkuk rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Why would we need another priest, did he say? If the Aaronic priesthood was good enough, why do we need another priesthood? Good question. For when there was a change in priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. This goes out to all the atheists out there that want to badger Christians on thinking that we continue following the Mosaic law. You guys got to read up on Hebrews some more often. For the one for of whom these things were spoken belong to another tribe for which no one has ever served at the altar. And that is to say, for it is evident that our Lord is descended from Judah. Judah, yeah, obviously. Judah can't hold an Aaronic priesthood because it only comes through Levi. And in connection with that tribe of Moses, he had said nothing about priests. Yeah, Moses said nothing about Judah holding priesthood. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement requiring bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Hallelujah. Yeah. The Melchizedek priesthood is not tied to descendancy. It is tied by the power of an indestructible life, namely Jesus, who cannot die. A priest forever. Permanently. For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We see this type in the Old Testament. Just two references. The prophecy of David in 110, Psalm 110, just hangs there for a thousand years in the culmination of which comes to this higher, more, a better priesthood and our high priest in Jesus Christ. If you take anything away from that teaching that I have now spent at least 40 minutes on, between both classes. That's what I want you to take away. This is a type. This is very complicated stuff. But it all culminates into Jesus. Uh, we had a, a section in your handout where pastor has typical offices or typological offices, OT priesthood. And so while we're covering priesthood, I just want to skip there and then go back. So he, I want to cover Hebrews 4.14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. But when Jesus appeared as a high priest of good things that are to come, then through the greater, more perfect tent, not being made by hands, that is, not of this creation. So what does that refer to, Mike, there? Not made by hands, that is, not of this creation. He just referenced it earlier. What is he contrasting here? The temple. The temple. Before the true temple, where... The, 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 the fullness of God had dwells bodily. That's why Jesus said he's the temple. Because the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him. He is the true temple. High priest of good things that have come th then through the greater and the more perfect tent. Not made by hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all in the holy places. Not by means of blood blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And if you want to reference my um, preaching that I did at the very end of the first class that I did, tie these all together. That with the verses here. Questions? We've got about uh, ten minutes here. I'm going to go through this. Um, we move to our handout where I've now covered typological persons, Elijah, Melchizedek, Melchizedek for a good 40 minutes now, typological institutions, OT sacrifice. OT sacrifice in your handout. Yeah, uh, so I want to cover it, and Pastor wanted me to cover it this way. In the book of Exodus, we learn about these 10 plagues um, that are 
carried out as punishment of, of Yahweh against the Egyptians. And in these scenes, we know that each plague corresponds to a god of, from Egypt. Uh, this one's pretty good. I would have a disagreement with a few minor things here, but this is good enough. So we have the plague and the god that it goes against, that it rivals against in Egypt. And the perennial god in the pantheon of Egypt was the sun. As you can see, they're, they're getting progressively uh, worse, you can say, and at the same time progressively against the power of the god themselves. The Nile being the lifeline of the Egyptians, it dried up, you know, it, it, you would be in starvation mode at that point. But the, the Nile turning into blood was one, but the magicians, yeah, they were able to copy it, no big deal. But now we go to something that they can't copy that really has seemingly no explanation because it's the highest god up there, the sun, Ra, the Egyptian god Ra or Amon Ra, depending on who you're talking to. I'm not sure if it's even there. Yeah, it should be R-A, by the way. No, R-E, R-A, Ra. Uh, so it, it gets blackened. And Moses goes a couple times, you know, I'll, I'll say several times to Pharaoh and say, just let us go. He just doesn't do it. He hardens his heart. So Yahweh has to make it clear to him. Uh, because Pharaoh at that time saw himself as what? A God. A God. Saw himself as God incarnate. And he was going to pass on, pass that on to his son. Particularly, primarily his firstborn son. This is the theological reason why Yahweh has to take him out. He's got to get the message real clear now. You're not God. Yahweh, I am the Most High God. So, you are to take a lamb without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep, from the goats. Keep it until the 14th day of his, this, this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. Take the lamb, you're going to sacrifice it, you're going to place the blood over the to two doorposts and the lintels of the house. And when this plague comes, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you're at. And when, you, when I see the blood, I will pass over and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this is a type. This particular scene is a type who has its full culmination, a foreshadow, a prefigurement of Christ whose blood is shed and covers over our sins. And we've learned this many times in Sunday school. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And the next day, John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Very well. Now, I want to move on to Sabbath here. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath being a type in the Old Testament going through its culmination in the new. Once again, we land in Hebrews. Therefore, the promise of entering his rest still stands. Let us fear lest any of us should seem to fail to reach it. For the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard not did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Who are you talking about? They shall not enter my rest. The Israelites. Yeah. Exodus scene. They didn't go into the promised land, as Pastor Thompson has been covering, uh, alluding to, I should say, in his sermons in the morning. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. I'm going to last five minutes, I'll preach on that. 
And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of their disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David and so long afterward in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not had to spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God from whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now in the last few minutes I'm going to do some preaching here, if I may. In the book of Genesis, in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, we read about God creating the heavens and the earth. And this seminal passage of Scripture Unfortunately, many pastors from many pulpits will preach that the culminating event of this entire creation is the creation of man. I submit to you that they're completely wrong. Remember, there are no chapter divisions when the Bible was first written. And I can assure you the end of this section of Scripture ends in Genesis 2.4. I submit to you that the culminating event of the creation is day seven when God rests. Why? Because in the book of Revelation, the culminating event and what we were talking about here typologically and what Hebrews has just demonstrated to us is the culminating event of our Christian walk is to rest in the Lord. Is to enter God's rest just as He rested from His work. Because I rest in Christ. And He's done all the work for me. Sufficiently on the cross and through his active obedience. I submit to you that the culminating event of creation is day seven. It is not a view being man centric. The Bible is written to be theocentric, God centered. And that is my argument that I will make that the culminating event of the creation narrative is when God rests on day seven. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you this evening thankful for all that your Son has done. And we pray that those that are lost in the world, those that are weary and heavy laden, may come unto him and find rest. We pray for our lost loved ones, our friends, that they too may be decisively born again, drawn by your Spirit. And we say these things in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.